Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. Good evening and welcome to World Affairs Today. I'm Heidi Shute, President of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., and on behalf of the board and members, it's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening. Tonight our guest is Robin Wright. Robin is one of America's foremost Middle East journalists and reporters, author and foreign policy analyst who brings decades of experience in understanding of uh, and, and, and experience in the region to her writing. She is the author of six books, this is her seventh tonight, about Islam and the Middle East, including Dreams and Shadows, The Future of the Middle East in 2008, and The Last Great Revolution, Turmoil and Transformation in Iran, 2000. The Arabic word jihad means struggle and can be defined as an inner struggle within an individual. In Rock the Kasbah, Robin Wright looks at the internal struggle underway in the Middle East, particularly within the young demographic, where a new order is being shaped even as we watch and wonder what it means for them and for the political, social, and economic landscape that will emerge. And for us, for the United States and our relationship with the peoples and country of the countries of the region, a region so very vital to our national interests and to the world generally. Ms. Wright has been a fellow at the U.S. Institute of Peace, the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, the Brookings Institution, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and at Yale, Duke, and Stanford. She has reported from 140 countries for the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, the New Yorker, the New York Times Magazine, Time, the Atlantic, Foreign Affairs. You get the idea. The list goes on and on. Among her many awards, she has won the U.S. Correspondence Gold Medal, the, the National Magazine Award, and the Overseas Press Club Award for best reporting in any medium requiring exceptional courage and initiative. And she received that award prior to her appearance on the Colbert Report. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are delighted to have her here with us this evening. Please join me in welcoming Robin Wright. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here. Uh, it's a special privilege, and I always enjoy coming to the World Affairs Council. Um, I should give you a little bit of background about why I wrote this book and where I've come from. In, on October 6, 1973, I landed in the Middle East for the first time. It was the day the Fourth Middle East War broke out. Uh, I ended up covering every war after that, the intifadas, a half dozen wars in other parts of the world, to the point that my father said to me that he would never dare go on vacation, even to Bermuda, because he knew there'd be a coup d'etat. <laughs> uh, I've loved every moment of it, and there's something about the Middle East particularly that once you've been there, draws you back time and time again. Every time I tried to go to another part of the world, I kept being drawn back. I witnessed one of the most important revolutions of the modern era in 1979 with the Iranian Revolution. It, along with the Russian Revolution that introduced communism and the French Revolution that introduced democracy, the Iranian Revolution introduced a whole new political idiom, and that was political Islam. It has been an enormous influence uh, across the, the world, the 57 nations of the Islamic world, the 22 nations of the Arab world since then. In 1983, uh, I lived in Beirut, and I witnessed the first bombing against the U.S. Embassy compound by a Shiite extremist, and the bombing of the Marine compound, which was the largest loss of U.S. military life in a single incident since Iwo Jima, um, still to this day, and the largest non-nuclear explosion in a single incident since World War II as well. Uh, so I've seen the entire, you know, 35 years of political Islam, of extremism. And I've written about its many stages along the way. In advance of the 10th anniversary of 9-11, I decided I wanted to go back to the region and see what had happened in the Islamic world in this pivotal decade, 
We know what it's done to us in changing our sense of security, our fear about America's place in the world, our ability to fight what we think are inferior powers, um, our difficulty in learning how, when we can win militarily, then to figure out how to rebuild in a way and create alternative states. And I had a wonderful time writing this book. I went to lots of different places and discovered along the way that three things particularly were changing the region. One was the demographics. The fact that two-thirds of the population in the Arab world particularly of 300 million people were under the age of 30. This is a baby boom, the largest baby boom proportionately in the world. And we know what the baby boom, of which I am a part, did to the United States in changing the face of, the, of, of this country. The second was the fact that the majority of people for the first time in this region are literate. They may not have high school degrees and clearly not college degrees in most countries, but the fact is it has given them the means to see beyond their immediate environment, to have a sense of the country, the region, and particularly the world. They are aware of what's happened elsewhere over the last 30 years. And it's also made it possible for them to take advantage of the tools of technology, which have given them the means to connect with each other and, again, to understand the world. It's amazing to people like me who witnessed the birth of Al Jazeera in 1996, the first satellite channel that was able to circumvent state-controlled media in all of the Arab world. And today, there are over 500 independent satellite channels in just the Middle East. It's astounding how that has changed a sense of the world, a sense of what's possible, and connected young people. So I found that these three factors were transforming virtually every country I went to. And as I sat down to write in December, things began to pop. And a couple of things in the first country are a microcosm of this trend. In November last year, a young rapper named El General in Tunisia wrote a song that challenged President Ben Ali and his 23-year regime in a way no politician had ever been willing to do. And 20 percent of Tunisia's population is on Facebook in a country where hip-hop and rap were outlawed, where they couldn't perform in public, where uh, they couldn't record where the state control media was banned from uh, uh, recording them or allowing them to perform. So he put his lyrics on Facebook and they challenged the regime for the um, corruption uh, in a country where thousands were feeding off garbage, where police pr provided no protection and often engaged in the kind of corruption that made it impossible for people just to eke their way through um, a kind of normal uh, life. And so he put this song on Facebook, and it began to change the kind of dynamics. It was bold. Uh, the young were captivated by this song. A month later, a young street vendor in a remote town of Tunisia in Sidi Bouzid was confronted by an inspector, as he often had been before, and he was asked to pay a bribe, seven dollars, ten dinars, a standard bribe, and uh, he refused. Seven dollars is basically a, a good day's earnings and selling his fruit on the street. And the inspector harassed him with the help of uh, two other people, confiscated his fruit, took his electronic scale, and he was so outraged he started going from office to office to government office to, to demand justice, to get back his produce, to get back his electronic scale. He supported his um, 
four or five siblings, his mother and his ailing uncle. And when he was rebuffed time and time and time again, he finally went to the governor's office in the local province and covered himself with paint thinner and set himself on fire. And what was fascinating was the degree to which as people began to turn out to protest what had happened and the government's failure to help him, that the protest was captured again on the social media and beamed across Tunisia and then the world, picked up by Al Jazeera and replayed so that suddenly something that was very local, this was not the first young man to set himself on fire, but it was one that was captured. And it had a transformative effect. And it's people galvanized in first city Bouzid and then as it moved across the country, people sang the song of El General, the young rapper. And so the two played into each other. We often ask how much impact has the social media had? And it's clear that the majority of people don't have access. But enough do, and it spreads by word of mouth, that it led to the uh, 30 days later to the flight of President Ben Ali to Saudi Arabia. So um, what it also reflected, and it's appropriate to kind of talk about that on the 10th anniversary of 9-11, was what I call the new martyrdom. That Mohammed Atta was the name that all of us remember from 9-11, the lead mastermind hijacker on 9-11. What's fascinating about uh, Mohammed Bouazizi, the young fruit vendor, was that he represented someone who was not trying to kill anyone else, was not trying to um, uh, take civilians or government officials. He, he killed himself to shame a government. And he was far more effective than any of the Al-Qaeda operatives or the other militants in forcing the ouster of a government. And so this was a really important turning point. And one of the things that you find throughout the region in each of these countries is that there's a whole new generation of the new martyrs who are willing to stand up to the regime. In Syria, there's a 13-year-old boy who named Hamza Khatib who was out protesting. He was separated from his family. They didn't know what happened to him. The family de was desperate, went to the government to ask what had happened to him. Uh, looked at the hospitals, then inquired at the prisons to find out what had happened to their son. And a month later, his body was returned to the family. And he had been, um, he had several cigarette burns on his body. Uh, he had three gunshot wounds, and his genitals had been severed. 13-year-old boy. But he, when his family wanted to shy away or get away from the protest for fear of repercussions, he stayed out there. There are so many young people today who are really changing the dynamics of the region. Um, now, one of the, the, the things that has also struck me is not just the politics of the uprisings, the kinds of things we, we've seen now successfully in Egypt, Tunisia, and Libya, ongoing in Syria and Yemen, but also the culture of change. And one of the reasons I picked the title of, for my book, Rock the Casbah, was it reflected that kind of almost whimsical interest in using uh, cultural outlets, not just the voice on the street in challenging and changing the political environment. And I write about what I think is uh, the kind of broader sense of a, a counter jihad. And it's an effort through both political and cultural means to take back the concept of jihad to what it originally was, which is to be a good Muslim, to uh, engage in acts of goodness, not acts of hatred. And this was reflected in one of my favorite cultural outlets, and that's among the playwrights, who are taking the word jihad and putting it into their titles and writing about themes that are changing how we perceive this central idea that for us has symbolized what, you know, the idea behind the war on terrorism. And one of my favorite plays is called Till Jihad Do Us Part, and a play on the marriage vow. And it's a romantic comedy. And it's about how to be a good spouse, a marital partner. 
It has nothing to do with killing Westerners or challenging foreign governments. Another, and it's written by uh, an Indian Muslim. Another of my favorites is Jihad Jones and the Kalashnikov Babes. And it's written by an Egyptian. And it's about stereotypes of Islam. And the lead character is a young actor who's just come off playing Hamlet and is offered the role of a lifetime in a big Hollywood film. But of course, and a million bucks and playing with you know the dishiest actress in Hollywood, the problem is, of course, that he has to play the terrorist. And so his big dilemma is what to do. And it's a wonderful play. I, I read the script. Uh, riding on the quiet car between New York and Washington, and I laughed so loud that that people were, you know, giving me dirty looks. Um, another one of the kind of cultural aspects of the counter jihad are the new Muslim comedians, and I want to read you one of the jokes. I have to read it because I don't tell it nearly as well as he does, and it's by a, a comedian named Maaz Jobrani, who is Iranian-born, and uh, he's a member of uh, a group called the Access of Evil Comedy Tour. Uh, so this is his joke. You know, one guy can really mess it up for the rest of us, he says when he's shaking his shaved head as he paces the floor. Look at the Christmas Day bomber, the guy who tried to blow up the Northwest flight from Amsterdam to Detroit this Abu Abu Mustafa Boo Boo, or whatever his name is. I say this guy's crazy. Come on, any man would back me up. After all, where was the bomb? He looks out incredulously at the audience. Yeah, right, in his underwear. I mean, really, any normal man would question that instruction. He then switches to a Middle East accent and pretends to be a normal hijacker talking in his last discussion with his terror master. Uh, excuse me, I have one, uh, one last question for you. You say my reward in heaven will be 72 virgins. So you, do you think maybe we could put the bomb someplace else? <laughs> I mean, I really think I'm going to need my penis. <laughs> this is not what we think of when we think of comedic humor. And what's so interesting about the new Muslim comedians, is the way they are ridiculing terrorists. They are using humor as an instrument to reject extremism and rally others against it. And they are also using it as an instrument to integrate with the outside world. Uh, in the same way, whether it's black comedians, Jewish comedians, today George Lopez, a Latino comedian, have used humor as a way of integrating it in society, showing a common culture that they all have the same problems with their mothers-in-law. Uh, and so they're also, the, many of them who have started, they learned uh, humor at home, became immigrants here, learned stand-up, are now taking humor back to the region. And it's one of the really hopeful trends in bridging cultures, in bringing them together. And uh, Maz and several of his colleagues now hold several times a year something they call the Arabs Gone Wild um, comedic kind of seminar. And they do one in Amman, another one in Egypt. Uh, uh, one of, several of them have performed at clubs in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and as a result, you begin to see the comedic humor emerging. Bassam Yusuf is the new John Stewart of Egypt. And he has a mock news program with mock reporters. And at the height of the uprising, he did a wonderful skit about um, an actress who was complaining, com and it's a true story, but he did a takeoff on it, complained that at the height of the uprisings when the streets were blocked off that she had problems getting pizza home delivered. Uh, there's another young comedian who calls himself the Jerry Seinfeld of Saudi Arabia. Think about that a minute. The Jerry Seinfeld of Saudi Arabia. The whole idea that he could invoke a Jewish comedian, a Jewish American comedian as his model shows you that even in Saudi Arabia, things have begun to change. Not at the top, but among the young. And on that note, let me just point out a couple of facts about Saudi Arabia to show you how 
the youth demographic is so important. The average age in Saudi Arabia is 25, 26. Two thirds, over two thirds are under 30. The average age of a cabinet minister in Saudi Arabia is 65. The king is 87. His heir apparent, who's never going to make it because he's quite ill, is 82. The third in line is 78. We're not talking about a generation gap. We're talking about two or three generations, that there's a disconnect. And yes, Saudi Arabia is going to be the toughest place to witness change. It will take the longest to play out. But there is today not a single country in the 22-nation era block that be, will not witness change over the next decade. Um, now, I want to uh, leave plenty of time for questions, because I know that uh, many of you will want me to kind of direct me to specific countries and uh, specific challenges. But one of the things that's interesting to me is how the U.S. has responded to this, what is an epic convulsion, arguably the single most important change anywhere in the world in the early 21st century. There was a period uh, of 11 days in February when the United States uh, responded to the people in the streets <coughs> because they had to. We had no choice. And we abandoned a policy that had been in place for 60 years. President Obama came out in early February and understood that Hosni Mubarak was not going to survive politically the year. And initially, he called for the kind of change that would allow Mubarak the dignity of being eased out, waiting till September this month for elections. But within 11 days, the demonstrations on the street had reached the point that the President of the United States had to abandon a stalwart ally who had been central to a pillar of our policy in the region for 30 years. We took one of the most important steps after years of supporting geriatric autocrats during those 11 days. The problem is our policy has been quite inconsistent. We have supported democracy across North Africa into the Levant into Syria. But when it comes to the Gulf countries, our policy remains pretty much the same. And that is, we want stability. We want to make sure we have access to the resources. And, and it's understandable, given the economic challenges we face. But we are seen yet again in the Middle East as hypocritical, that we want change only so far, and that we're not willing to talk the talk with our allies in saying there are new realities in the region. And for that, there's a danger of down the road. We're going to pay a price. Now, the kind of change we're seeing today is really only the beginning of the beginning. We have a long, long way to go as this plays out. The euphoria after 18 days of uprisings in Egypt and 30 days in Tunisia are now being confronted with the raw realities of what replaces it. And none of these countries are prepared. And only one of the 22 Arab countries has the resources or the kind of dynamics in order to make this transition. And that, ironically, is Libya, a country with only 6.5 million people and a lot of oil resources. And the challenge is going to be for the rest of them, how do you overcome the flight of capital, the lack of private investment in uncertain times, uh, stock markets that plummet or gyrate, the fact that tourism stops in Egypt, which is an enormous sector of uh, an important sector of their economy, where in Tunisia it's 400,000 jobs in a country of 10 million people, that these, none of these countries can afford the transition. And the real danger is that in the aftermath of what has been extraordinarily inspiring, we face the problems of these countries not being able to provide either the political rights or the economic spoils. Because a lot of what happened with the young street vendor in Tunisia and the kids who've turned out elsewhere 
is that it's the economy, stupid. And they want the sense of dignity, not just in a free election, but in a sense that they have a future and that they're part of society and have opportunity, whether it's a job or access to education or an income so that they can leave home and marry and have an independent life. I think this is where we're really vulnerable. The other key area where we're vulnerable is the issue of a constitution. And we all focus on who's going to win the next election, when the real challenge is what are the new constitutions going to say. Iran's revolution in 1979 was followed by a year and a half in which the technocrats played a tremendously important role in running the country. But it was as the groups that had one mar once marched on the streets together against the Shah began to fight each other for what does the new constitution look like, what does the new state look like, and then began to fight with each other, and some began to kill each other. More than 1,000 um, uh, top Iranian officials in the military, in the ju judiciary, and uh, uh, 27 members of parliament, a president, a prime minister, were assassinated in the first 18 months. And there was such chaos as 6,400 amendments were offered for a new constitution that that's the moment that Ayatollah Khomeini came, returned and said, from Qom, from the, the, the town where the clerics um, uh, taught the religious center of Iran, and said, the clerics must play a role in preventing chaos and creating order and a sense of what, the, you know, what was to follow. And that's the moment at which the clerics overtook the system. Now, no one today wants another Iran in the region. There's an enormous difference between Sunni and Shiite, between the role of the clerics in Iran. The Shiites look to their clerics a little bit like Catholics look to the Pope. There's an infall a sense of infallibility that they can translate God's word to the believers. But it, the, the problem is going to be as they sit down and try to iron out all these different voices who suddenly feel they have a right to, to have a stake, have a say in writing a new constitution. As they uh, become more politicized, the question will be what kind of constitution? And that sets the framework for the future. Now, it's clear that the next decade, I think, will be defined by two forces. One is the greater quest for political participation, independent press, emerging civil society, rights of minorities and women, an end to corruption. But at the same time, there will also be something that, to us in the outside world, often looks like it conflicts, and that's a, the growing role of Islam. Uh, but it will be a different kind of political Islam than we've witnessed over the last 30, 35 years. Today, Islam is a means to an end, not the end in itself. And when it's like a tornado. When people face a tornado, they go to the basement and they cling to the pillars to help them get through transitions. And then they come up and rebuild. And it's the same thing in a political tornado. People go to, the, to their soul and cling to the pillars of identity. And then they come up and try to rebuild uh, a state, a society. And I think that during this transition, we're going to see these two forces that often seem to us to conflict that will become natural allies. But again, not because people want another Iran, want a religious state. They will want, um, uh, in the same way, you know, Western societies, Judeo Christian values to define our societies. They'll want um, Muslim values to just to define their future, but not under the kind of rigid religious rule. So um, normally I'll end by telling you that normally I'm a pessimist. I'm not the one who says, is the glass half full or is the glass half empty? I'm the one who says, is there really any water in the glass at all? And I've covered this extraordinary period of turbulence over, as again, dating back to the 1970s, um, the birth of extremism, <coughs> radicalism. And I think that for the first time, we're beginning to turn a corner. And it is particularly as we mark, you know, 10 years in Afghanistan as well, and uh, eight years in Iraq, that, that we understand that we can kill extremists we can get bin Laden and some of, and many of his operatives, but we can't win. You know, the, we can't transform societies ourselves. We have to rely on people in the region 
to play the pivotal role. And I think for the first time, we're beginning to see that happen. And so at the end of the day, I think there really is some water in the glass. So I'll end with that and open up to your questions. Um, you know, I've been looking at the brave people in Syria and how they come out even in the face of gunfire and tanks and, and all that. And I'm just wondering uh, how, they, how they could win. Uh, you know, in, in, in many cases, it's the military that refuses to, uh, uh, you know, shoot on, the, on their people. Uh, but in this case, of course, uh, the military is mostly Alawites, uh, the same sect as the uh, dictator. And, uh, you know, they're willing to carry out any orders in, in, in such an atmosphere. Uh, how can there be a revolution? Syria is clearly the most important country now in the region when it comes to defining what happens next. Uh, not just because it's the most interesting, but because of its geostrategic location on Israel's border, on Turkey and NATO ally, on Iraq, on Jordan, on Little Lebanon. It's also politically been the spoiler when it comes to Arab-Israeli peace. So on the bigger issues, what happens in Syria plays out too. It is true that um, Assad has managed so far to put down or to prevent the uprising from becoming the kind of pivotal challenge that will force him out. At the same time over the past month, I think for the first time, We've reached that threshold where Assad cannot survive politically long term. The king of Saudi Arabia has come out and said he no that Assad no longer has legitimacy. The president of Turkey has challenged his credibility and called on, on him to take extraordinary steps and hinted that that still won't be enough. The European Union has imposed sanctions that economically will make it very tough on this regime to sell its oil, an important source of revenue. And Syria has very limited um, reserves. Uh, the United States has called on um, Assad to step aside. That the world generally has made the decision that he can't survive. Syria is trying to pull in Iran, what Iran did in the aftermath of the 2009 elections, when sporadic uh, uprisings, street protests, ran on for six months and the regime managed to quash it. And allegedly or reportedly with Iranian help, the Syrians are trying the same thing. But as you point out, what is so striking is the Syrians have been so much more active in so many places, not Damascus yet, on the suburbs of Damascus, not as much in Aleppo, but across the country. You know, what started the uprising in Syria were 13 and 14 year olds who wrote some anti-government graffiti on public walls. And when they were picked up, people took to the streets of a remote town. These not a politicized people. This is a police state. I've been to Syria many, many times uh, since the late 1970s. And it is the most awful police state. Uh, I actually think, again, this is some place that, that Assad can't survive that the forces of history are not in his favor. How it plays out, I don't know. But um, I've said that I think that a year from now, he won't be there. And if he is, it's because he's engaged in such dramatic, astounding change. Uh, and I don't think he's capable of that. It, it seems to me that, that perhaps Al-Qaeda laid the seeds of its own destruction on 9-11 in the Middle East and provided a catalyst for the, for what we saw in January this past year at the same time that Al Qaeda laid the, laid out a path that a gullible United States followed uh, to economic privation here they've also um, galvanized a a youth movement which has said, we do not want theocracy, nor do we want autocracy. We mm -hmm. want self-governance. Could you, is, is that a relatively accurate assessment? I think you're right. I think Al-Qaeda overshot, as they say. And I think what's so interesting is the degree to which the violence Al-Qaeda and its affiliates engaged in so alienated so many people. You know, we lost 
something like 200 people to suicide bombs in Iraq. We had enough protection that we weren't as vulnerable. Iraqis since 2003 have lost 12,000 people just to suicide bombs and over 30,000 injured. We forget the price they have paid. And whether it's Al-Qaeda's attacks in Riyadh, I went with Colin Powell the day after those attacks. Um, we landed there in these, you know, the residential compounds in Riyadh. There were four of them. And very well orchestrated uh, uh, attacks that all went off within a five minute period in diverse parts, killing lots of people. But in the string of attacks that followed over about an 18 month period, the majority of people who were killed were not Westerners, but Muslims. The bombs in, for the first, the first suicide bombs in Morocco and Casablanca, again, multiple places, 2003, and I went and talked to many of the, of the people, that they became as angry. When we look at what turned Iraq around when it really looked like it was going to disintegrate, it was in 2007 when a tribal leader in Anbar province, the most volatile of the 18 provinces in Iraq, had lost his father and two brothers to Al-Qaeda assassinations. Business and the economy in Anbar was dreadful. Nothing was moving. And so he galvanized first the other tribal elders, and then 90,000 Iraqis just from Anbar province to take on Al-Qaeda. We deployed in context of that awakening and that, the two together, allowed or led to the, the turnover, the transition, to a place that Anbar became comparatively stable. Now, there are lots, there are lots of ongoing problems. And the fact is, once the U.S. goes, there, the Shiite-dominated government has not done enough to help the Sunnis who've taken on al-Qaeda. But the fact is, in so many of these countries, as you rightly point out, it is the alienation of the of the people on the ground that has turned them around, not anything we've done, and sometimes, in fact, despite what we have done. Um, I'm one of those who thinks Iraq was the biggest foreign policy mistake we've ever made. And, uh, sorry? Well, whatever. And, and it is, in some ways, miraculous that we have found people who will do our work for us. And that's my whole point about how do we, you know, turn around the region. Um, the uprisings were also in part a reaction to the fact that nobody wanted a foreign army coming in and changing a regime and trying to install someone else, someone who was an ally of ours or trying to set up a system that either didn't work or gave one group power over another. Um, and, and so they've taken the initiative. One of the interesting things when I look at, you know, how does this era differ from the earlier rounds? In the 70s, we saw the emergence of political Islam. In the 80s, we saw the birth of extremism, the first suicide bombs, first among the Shiites and then spread by the end of the decade to the Sunnis. In the 1990s, we saw this interesting blend as a lot of Islamic parties or Islamist parties, Hezbollah, Hamas, um, uh, ISLA in Yemen, the Islamic Action Front in Jordan, began to use, to, to run for office, the Muslim Brotherhood openly. And they were experimenting with, in Hezbollah's case, both the bullet and the ballot, in the other case, just with the ballot, participating in a system that they had previously rejected, changing from within, not from outside. And what we've seen, but all of those were reactions, either to local governments, foreign armies, getting involved and so forth. What's been interesting in this, in the last four or five years, has been the way that this is proactive. They've taken the initiative, and it's not re reaction to someone else, it's because they wanted to define their future. And I think that's what gives us also a little bit more hope, despite the fact it's going to be one hell of a turbulent period ahead. And we're often going to be nostalgic about um, the simplicities of uh, days of dealing with one guy in Hosni Mubarak in Egypt where you picked up the phone and said, we want X, Y, or Z. Uh, and not so easy. My question is, I spent, I was um, with 
the UAB, uh, U.S. Arab Chamber of Commerce. I went as a fellow, a business fellow, to Egypt in 2009. And I have a lot of, I mean, I have a lot of knowledge on the region, and I felt like every business we met with, NGOs to like, high-powered investment banks, they all had horrible things to say about the government. And it just felt like it was ready to explode yeah. then. Yeah. So what, like, why do you think it took so long? Because I was, sorry, I'm nervous. I was there in 2011 during the uprising as well. So I left 11 days into it. It was very scary. But what do you think could have happened instead that would have been more peaceful? You mean that we could have done? The, uh, no, the Egyptian people. Could have been more peaceful? Yeah. I thought it was pretty peaceful. I mean, the thing that strikes me about this whole change is that in the world's most volatile region, you saw in every country the uprisings begin through peaceful civil disobedience. That's a change that, you know, I've lived through so many wars, so many deaths, um, you know, having covered them all. Uh, one of the things I think about the United States and one of the reasons we missed it when, as you say, it was there for all to see was the fact that in the aftermath of 9-11, our first instinct is fear and to back away. And that we're so reliant in dealing with local leaders that we've dealt with elites, and that beyond that, when we talked about, let's talk to some women and so forth, we found those who spoke English, had been to Western universities, and were safe. We weren't willing to talk to a lot of the people on the street, to people who had a different voice. Uh, there was a study done by a think tank in Washington that looked at who got it right and who got it wrong in predicting what happened. And the interesting thing is the U.S. government did horribly, including the intelligence community. Academics did not do well because they were locked into their paradigms. NGOs got it much better because there was that, as you as you rightly acknowledge, that kind of one-on-one -on -one exchange. And journalists who have to cover it every day saw it happening, you know, beginning to take root. Uh, and there's a real important lesson there. And as these environments change, we're often going to have to talk to people that we don't want to and that may not be in the safest places. I remember going to the Palestinian election in 2006 and I was dumbfounded when the American embassy sent out um, convoys with armor-plated cars to go to these Palestinian refugee camps to look and see if the vote was fair. And they, you know, would race in their, you know, cramped, narrow streets, and people would kind of have to scatter, and they'd get out, and they'd have their security guards, and they go into the polling stations and they take a five minute look at kind of see, and then they get back in their cars and they leave. And you know, I was so embarrassed that they weren't on the ground kind of watching these things systematically, that we had such a conspicuous presence, that our first priority was our security rather than what was this, the freest and fairest Arab election ever held up to that point. So, you know, what you say resonates with me. Coming out of the liberation theology movement, uh, Pablo Freire wrote the book, of course, on the pedagogy of the oppressed. Mm -hmm. I've been watching all of these rebellions and revolutions. In all the years that I've been watching this and, and kind of tracking and blogging on it or whatever, only South Africa that I know of has ever instituted that kind of thing where they didn't go in and wholesale kill off the previous dictator and, and company. They did a real good job with that. Mm -hmm. uh, all the rest seem to do that, and they're seen doing it again in Egypt. Uh, there's calling for blood, et cetera, et cetera. And it, my opinion, as Pablo said, that automatically sets up the new country or the new entity for failure. It'll be another dictatorship. Now, is there any voice that you know of in the, in the Middle East, Levant, wherever, that's trying to say, instead of let's going in and wholesale killing off the former regime or whatever, imprisoning people, let's get the facts, let's do some forgiving so that we might have a chance for success like South Africa has uh, in our new country. 
I spent seven years in South Africa, and I was in Soweto the day it erupted in 1976 um, and did, you know, many years of it, and then went back to watch Nelson Mandela walk to freedom. Um, and I will take this moment and that example to point out that in South Africa today, a generation after Mandela walked to freedom, the average black lives worse off than he did under apartheid, right. and that the average age in South Africa because of AIDS and the government's failure to deal with you know, the many different sides of that challenge has dropped from 60 years when Nelson Mandela walked to freedom to 41 years today. Mm -hmm. uh, the Soviet Union, when it comes to change, today a generation after the collapse of uh, communism, you still have a former KGB chief and communist in power. Change takes a long time and it's gonna take probably even longer in a region that is he held out against democracy and political change longer than any place else. Um, I would, so I agree with you on, uh, you know, these other important places, but I would quibble with you on the fact that people are calling for blood. Um, Mahmoud Jabril gave an important speech, today's Wednesday, um, sometime in the last week in Tripoli, saying that we don't want to kill Qaddafi loyalists. People are talking today about justice. And the thing that's important is when you look at Hosni Mubarak's fate, they haven't killed him off. They're trying him in a public court, as well as his two sons, for supporting or for allowing the use of um, deadly weapons against protesters and for corruption. Um, there will be bloodshed in many of these countries. We're already seeing it, you know, in Syria with uh, the, you know, some people, a very tiny sector, have killed some um, uh, Syrian soldiers or so. So there are some credible reports. Yemen is a mess. Uh, but, you know, I don't, I think that, again, at least short term, and it could change based on a lot of wild cards, that the whole idea of revenge has been redefined too. And people want revenge, but they want it in a way that is public. The, the hanging of Saddam Hussein was provocative to many in the region. Uh, and they don't necessarily want to go through that again. He did not have a trial that was viewed as credible in many quarters. Right. And again, it depends on what happens in Syria and what happens in Yemen and a lot of these other countries, how it plays out. But in Libya, a country with 140 tribes and clans, 30 of which are important, a country that's been divided traditionally between Benghazi in the east and Tripoli in the west, where you had a lot of rival militias vying to take on Gaddafi. And now, you know, everyone's been predicting they will go after each other. There was a briefing at the State Department today that I listened in on um, by a senior admin administration official who was in Tripoli yesterday. Uh, and he came away con convinced that all the predictions so far about these forces taking each other on, it hasn't happened and that life is actually returning to normal in Tripoli with businesses opening, uh, uh, there's no fighting on the, on the streets for power. Uh, the focus is on finding Gaddafi. So it could all get derailed, but so far I'm not sure we're into all that bloodshed yet. Okay. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you might speak a bit about what you can foresee happening with Morocco. I know you haven't talked about it much um, in this lecture. I spent some time there last year and was before before February and then the weekend after the revolutions happened with the February 20th movement there. And I know it's been it, not as volatile as the others by any means and that they actually did pass their, their new constitution. They're focusing more on constitutional reform. But mm -hmm. if you, in terms especially of what you said about Islam coming into the ruling of these new c democracies that will be appearing? Islam will be, be something that helps define. I'm not sure they will always be Islamic parties. I don't think the Muslim Brotherhood will get at least 
you know, as of today, more than 25, 30 percent of the vote. But remember, they had 88 seats right. in Parliament under Hosni Mubarak, so this is not a new role. But Morocco is a good question, and it's the most Western geographically of the countries. The young, younger king has, uh, under pressure from women, and a million women or a million person march, changed family law, not yeah. enough, but changed family law in a way that has been a model for other countries. He allowed the Justice and Development Party, modeled on the Turkey Turkish party of the same name, to run and play an important role, marginalizing those who are really right. uh, like more like the Muslim Brotherhood in terms of what they want. The, the Justice and Development Party says, no, 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 we're not Islamic, uh, uh, we're like the Christian Democrats in, in Europe. Uh, my fear is that, oh, and, and for the person who asked about South Africa, um, uh, Morocco is the one country that had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission as well, and it was uh, modeled on what happened in South Africa. And it was very interesting, a guy I knew headed it, and um, unfortunately has since died, but he was a political prisoner for many, many years, and they, it was interesting that the king appointed him to head the commission, and he closed a lot of the prisons. There was a sorting out of who had disappeared and what happened to them. Compensation was offered, not a formal apology, but an acknowledgment of grave injustices uh, over a long period of time under the current king's father and grandfather, a period of 43 years. But then, after the Casablanca bombing in 2003, the king started using the same practices of his father and grandfather in going after suspected extremists and anybody who might be sympathetic, empathetic. And so the danger is that you institute, you, you right some wrongs, uh, but you don't embrace the principles enough that the practices can happen again. I think Morocco will go through important changes. Um, the question is how much will the king acknowledge for all these monarchies? And the king of Jordan is in the same position. Right. We take advantage or we take for granted that he's our ally, will continue to, that Jordan will continue to be a bastion of stability, and I think that's not a given. Uh, I think that they're, because of the geographic breakdown, 60 percent Palestinian, there are now 11 percent Iraqi refugees of the uh, Jordanian population, that the king has been unresponsive to some of the protests um, and the issues that people are unhappy about. Uh, none of these regimes want to do enough. And with each leader that is toppled, there is a magnification in the, 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 the it embold, each uprising, successful uprising, emboldens people to do more, to at, demand more, um, to expect more, and to compromise less. You really haven't touched on Turkey yet. Mm. And I was at a, a program on Saudi Arabia, and uh, one of the experts said that Turkey is now going to become the old Egypt in the Middle East, but the rulers, the powers that are still in power, would want Egypt to return to its natural leadership of the Middle East once it gets settled. Uh, could you comment on Turkey? Uh, uh, sort of moving in. And also, with s Iran now announcing today maybe the release of the two, hi uh, the two uh, hikers. hikers. But if you look at Syria, Syria is a client state of Iran. You agree with that? And then it's an ally. Hezbollah is uh, sort of hooked with Syria. And Lebanon now will be the president of the General Assembly. Looks like a for a month. For a month, but during the time in which the Palestinian yes is put forth. Look, Turkey is arguably the most important country in the Islamic world, by far, and it's really interesting the degree to which the Arabs, who have total disdain for the Ottomans, now look at Turkey as a model for the kind of balance they want between. Islam and politics. It's very interesting what er Prime Minister Erdogan has done. And I went to see him for my book, and I also went to see President Gul. And I was going to make my first chapter on Turkey as the model. And then as the uprisings happened, it was clear that 
Turkey was, you know, kind of on the back burner. But now that Erdogan has gone to Egypt and he's going to Libya and Tur Tunisia as well, uh, that he's trying to carve out a role for Turkey as the model. And it's not a bad model. It's far from perfect. Um, human rights abuses, pressure on the press, he's become a bit egomaniacal. But Turkey is going to be one of the big players all over the world, not just in the Middle East. And one of the tragic mistakes is that the European Union has not allowed it to become a member because that would really be a f an effective bridge. And Erdogan, the Islamic Party, although they will again say we're not an Islamic Party, has done more than any of the secular party or pro-Western parties in bringing Turkey into compliance with IMF um, standards, uh, European Union, you know, changing the economy. Uh, the GDP has shot up. Uh, people feel empowered. In many ways, Ataturk, the founder of modern Turkey, empowered 15 percent of the people, an elite. And Erdogan is the bookend having empowered the 85 percent that are the Anatolians. And it's really important what he's done. We underrate the role of Turkey. And I think that particularly when it comes to questions like Syria, and what models do you create? That Turkey is the model today, not Iran. And it's funny how even the Turkish soap operas are very popular in the Arab world. They're translated. And I remember a, a Saudi cabinet minister um, who on his the ringtone for his cell phone was the theme from a Turkish soap opera called Noor. So it, you know, the way it's permeated in uh, all aspects of Arab culture is fascinating to watch. On your question about uh, Lebanon and, or Hezbollah and, and, and Iran and Syria, look, King, King, uh, Abdullah of, of Jordan likes, he talked first, for the first time in an interview I did with him, about the Shiite crescent. And that interview then defined the whole phenomena that it's emerged with Iran, Iraq, Syria, and it's Shiite, you know, Alawite, and uh, Lebanon. And yes, they're allies. Shiite crescent? I'm not as convinced. Uh, Yes, they're all important players in defining the country, and Iran is up to mischief. But the interesting thing is the degree that the, the number of Syrians are rejecting the Iranian model. I appreciate your coming, and it was a lot of fun. Thanks. <laughs>